Casey Hyatt, welcome in. Thank you. Thanks for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. No worries. So you've been with Cumberland Heights for five years? I got here in October of 2016, so almost seven. Almost seven years. And today you're the alumni coordinator and the coordinator of the Recovery Care Advocate Program. Correct. Did I get that language right? Yeah, I think so. So you got your hands in a lot of what we do to support our patients while they're in treatment and a whole lot in terms of what happens afterwards. If you I'm love lucky. it? You yeah. like it? You love yeah, it? I absolutely love my job, yeah. What's the best part? Um, <clears throat> well, there have been a lot of best parts. When I was a recovery care advocate in the men's program, I got a lot of opportunity to um, you know, stay connected for years at a time with patients who I would have otherwise, you know, never, never saw again or, um, you know, but you get to see families come back together. You get to see dreams come alive and, and being able to be a part of, even if it's an observing part of people's lives, long-term in recovery, it's, it's one of those things that solidifies so much about my personal experience and, and gives my professional experience a lot more validity too. I think, uh, Clinicians, you know, generally in the residential field will see people for a very short period of time and hope for the best and, you know, wave on out the door and every once in a while they'll get an email or a letter. But as an RCA, you get to watch the whole picture on, unfold. So. so what is the Recovery Care Advocate Program? So at Cumberland Heights, it is an extended care management system, basically, if you were going to call it. A program, but specifically, um, recovery care advocates are individuals who have prioritized connection from day one in treatment, and their entire job is to build and manifest uh, an empathetic, compassionate, and caring relationship with every individual on their caseload so that that relationship can express itself once that individual patient has discharged completely from our care. So whether their last day with us is an IOP or their last day with us is in uh, Cumberland Heights community recovery um, or whatever the case may be, we continue to make those touch points after they leave at certain intervals. And we all have cell phones, so it's a two-way relationship. And for me, I was, a, I was an RCA between 2017 and 2019 and I still have multiple calls a week to patients that I worked with and and for that first year who are still clean or you know struggling with something or want to tell me about an amazing thing that happened or whatever the case may be so it's a team of seven team of seven right now and like pragmatically you can see RCAs or I see RCAs everywhere You know, in TPR meetings, in groups, you know, in the lunchroom, having breakfast, lunch, or dinner with a group of patients. I mean, they really are infused in almost every one of our programs. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's a little, it's a little more difficult for our IOP, excuse me, for our IOP RCAs because they're, they're working with a segment of our population that doesn't have the residential experience whatsoever. And so they're directly admitted into our intensive outpatient groups. And because of that, you know, you're talking about 12 hours a week of treatment versus how many hours are in a week in residential, right? Over a hundred. So you don't have as many of those points of interest to, to c- contact and communicate with while they're there. So they go ahead and start calling them while they're still in IOP and building those relationships and trying to get them to alumni events and things like that. Right. How does the RCA program complement uh, the clinical experience at Cumberland Heights? Well, it's interesting you say that. So when, when, when I started, I was the first and there really wasn't a, what's the best way to put this? There was no format. There was no, right. I mean, there was a job description, but it was more of a very hopeful job description. Like we hope to see this happen. And so it was really up to me to find a way to integrate myself into the day to day schedule as in, in a way that was meaningful and got me in front of everybody as often as possible. And so one of the things that I had going for me was really good relationships with the primary therapists. And 
they were kind enough to let me at first step in and, you know, for the first 15 minutes of group, just introduce myself and talk about a little bit of my recovery because self-disclosure was a big part of being an RCA. Um, at, you know, sharing that I'm a person in long-term recovery and what that looks for me and sharing what the RCA program is. So it was, it was so brand new. A lot of our patients had nothing to attach it to because the role hadn't really completely fleshed itself out in their recovery experience yet. And so we were constantly having to explain what we did. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so over time, the, the therapists in the men's program and the women's program and an IOP allowed us to be more and more a part of what happened in primary group, especially during step work. And w when we go over what we call the 20 consequences and things like that, because having that compliment for a therapist, whether they're in recovery or not, but almost especially if they're not in recovery, having someone who is in long-term recovery, who does have personal experience with the step work, who does have personal experience with the hard stuff that comes up in early recovery was a compliment that stood out in a way that completely changed a lot of the conversations and not only changed the conversations that happened in primary group, but the conversations that happened outside of primary group and looping us into treatment plan reviews and looping us into deeper conversations with family members during treatment created an axis that revolved every single working part of the treatment team in a way that gave a, a, a more global perspective on each individual patient. And that's happening every single day on a constant basis in a natural way now where at first it was kind of clunky and we were still figuring it out. But um, the incredible people that we have working on the recovery care advocate team now, it's almost like secondhand and it's, it's a very natural thing and it's very beautiful. So yesterday we were in a meeting and you were doing a presentation on kind of the RCA program top to bottom, which I've been really plugged into for many years. Sure. Um, but one of the things that I thought was so – that I'm really excited that you harped on and I want you to maybe comment on or tell a story about or whatever is the atmosphere of recovery that's created by the RCAs once a patient leaves treatment. And you, you talked about it a little bit, but one of the things in terms of – for those that might not be aware with how treatment works today – treatment tends to be very cross-sectional, you know, so you, you show up, you spend a couple weeks here, I think you referred to it as the bubble, you know, and then you're leaving and you're going to IOP or you're transitioning back to wherever you live from and there, you're in a new um, uh, program of some kind. Hopefully you're going to meetings. Hopefully you're trying to access something to do with recovery, right? But it can right. be really challenging. And the thing that's beautiful about the RCA program is, is that you referenced it as Cumberland Heights calling them, you know, and I, it was, it was different for me to think about it that way. Cause I, I know all the RCAs. So I think about them in terms of their personality mm -hmm. and their names and what they bring to our team. But absolutely. It's a unique way that Cumberland Heights still stays available right. to every patient or resident for up to a year after they leave treatment. And I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that or, just what have you learned about that? How receptive individuals are to that? Because it's a really unique way to stay in touch outside of what we've always done, which is alumni canoe trip, alumni sure. picnic, you know, a, a coffee meet and greet, what have you. It's an insular experience um, to be in residential treatment. I think anybody who has had the opportunity to go to treatment has a very specific memory bank yeah. of what happened. And I think for anyone, especially, you know, people who work in direct patient care, our CAs, our clinical associates, our RCAs, and several other staff who just have a specific passion to be able to be in the milieu, want to be one of those people they remember, right? They want to be someone who stood out as someone who was special to them, or I say they, I know for me, I wanted to be the Robin Cook, right, that, that, that read something during a group one day when we were doing a book study or, you know, stood next to me on the porch and called me on my BS or whatever the case may be, and it just stuck with me. Well, <laughs> I think for our RCAs, it's so much more than that. Like, there's an element of that with a lot of people that you connect with on a personality basis. Yeah. But so many people that you don't really connect with in that way 
when they see us call, we're attached to all of those memories. That's the ultimate goal is we're, we want to be attached to what, you know, some of the funny conversations that happened at lunch or some of the spades games that happened in the cabin or some of the, you know, the, the, the moments that created that inevitable shift in them that took place before, during, or after treatment, and we're still able to be almost like a call to response in a way because I don't want to be Casey because Casey's so small. Casey's almost nothing in the broad scheme of their recovery. But Cumberland Heights stands to be something now and later for them. And so if I can just be that connection, one, it minimizes my role because I can't be that big for everybody. I've worked with over a thousand people as an RCA. And if I tried to be, you know, everything, if I tried to be their recovery in any way, shape or form, I would just yeah. fall apart. And so being able to carry over that instead of trying to, you know, be the one. Yeah, is is a really special experience, and that's what I hope for all my recovery care advocates too. Is that they're they're able to find that one of my one of my primary goals in the beginning is to train them on, you know, you can't do anything for one of them that you can't do for all of them. What do you mean by that? So, if I find myself so covered with a specific case, which happens a lot. Cause I mean, we come into this cause we have compassion and empathy, right? And when someone is hurting, it feels like I am with the crisis. And so that, which is a natural response to caring about someone can over time, it can overlap my ability to help anyone else. And without getting too deep into like the philosophy I have around that and what some would say, you know, getting involved with the, the disease instead of the person, mm. Um, I'll say that if I get too invested, if I'm work, if I'm, if I'm doing so much work that I end up doing more than they're willing to do for their own personal recovery, I'm not doing any favors at all. I'm not helping them at all. I might be helping them in that moment, but long term, I'm not teaching them how to recover. I'm teaching them how to go to me every time they have a problem. And that's not what I want for people. I want people to, to, to discover because it's already true that they have everything they need to recover already. And so helping people unmask themselves in their own eyes, right? We say the masks have to go, but the truth is the masks are, are the same ones we're looking at in the mirror too. So we empower people as opposed to, um, you know, I don't know. So how do you strike that balance? I, that was great. Love that. How do you, but how do you strike that balance? How do you, cause uh, I think you referenced it talking to the disease versus the person and then also creating the boundary professionally as an RCA and your team, I'm sure deals with it every single day. How do you figure out where that line is? A lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I'd get off the phone and realize I wasn't going to be able to make any more calls that day. You know, I'd set aside three hours of my day to make just sit and make calls and check in on, on guys. And I would realize in a moment, like, oh, I used it all up. You know what I mean? For good reason. Sure. And, you know, looking at it as work is really difficult because, you know, you want to be efficient and you want to be, yeah. you know, you want to be able to, you know, really carry out the expectations that your manager has or your organization or whatever. And that when the truth is, is, if I make another call, I might not have anything to give this guy. And God for you know, God forbid I I I I show up half half full for anyone. And one of my favorite like teaching points was, and and I had a sponsee tell me this once, and I didn't realize I told him, but he was working here as a CA before way before I was ever uh, his sponsor. And he was complaining about something. He was going through something. It was he was working in First Step. We used to have a program here called First Step, and so you got a lot. A lot of uh, early, you know, you might have a uh, thirty guys with less than a week clean, and uh, he was run ragged. And I said, I said, you know, the whole thing about your cup runneth over. Have you heard that? He said, Yeah. I said, Well, they get the runneth over. Your cup has to stay full, or you don't have any value to them. And I think in looking at it through that lens, I was able to draw a line at where my heart stopped and my mind started 
because when I became robotic and I was saying the recovery things, but I couldn't feel them anymore, mm. that was the line. That was the, I'm going to go take a walk around the trail. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go just sit in the butt hut and just have a non recovery related conversation and just talk about football or whatever, you know? And, it, and so it's, it's, it's definitely just as much part of the training and learning how to balance that world because nobody gets exposed to as many newcomers as we do. You know, there's nobody that's out there working with people in a triage state who's just in regular 12 step recovery, unless you're just going to constant meetings all day long. Right. It's such an important thing to think about in terms of, um, the day-to-day -day life of working for a treatment organization. Yeah. You know, I, I hadn't heard it put that way, but like, you know, our organization does deal with more newcomers than anybody else on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the, the, pro our programs are full of them, you know, today at this site, we have over a hundred, you know, and I bet it's not just the RCAs, but the counselors and the case managers and the kitchen staff and the nurses, it's everybody Definitely the nurses that they're... that are literally the face of change and recovery and treatment every single day. And there's people that have worked here for 20, 30 years, and it's a it's a higher responsibility as a recovering professional to make sure your cup is ru is runneth over. Yeah, yeah. you know, every day it's not going to happen. Yeah. There are going to be those days that you were, you know, that I, that, there are those days that I operated a deficit. Uh, luckily enough, there's some folks around here that are like, hey. Yeah. You doing all right? Well, I that's absolutely true. And I think that's what makes residential treatment specifically so much not easier. But I know, I know when I'm not okay and it's okay for me to be not okay, especially since I can tell everybody on my team that I'm not okay. Right. Because they can fill in the, those gaps. Because we're not all sick at the same time, hmm. right? And so that deficit doesn't occur in 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 unison. Thank God. Yeah. Um, you know, when I got clean here, because you know I came through Cumberland, you know that in 2010 there wasn't an RCA program, and lucky luckily enough, I stayed in the community. So I was in a halfway house and I was doing the thing, and there was at that time a really big uh, contingency of volunteers, of people who were alumni who would come back every Friday and every Saturday. And I'm not like every Friday and every Saturday. Sure. And it was in some ways my organic RCA program. Yeah. You know, it was because we came every Friday and every Saturday yeah. <laughs> uh, until I moved. I, I moved away about a year after I got, I, I got clean and sober here. And so, I mean – for a lot of that year, me and Nico Dorn and Jamie Gibbons and um, Jamie Johnson and John, but I mean, a lot Absolutely. of people were, were, they were my RCAs, Yeah, you know, Johnny Rosen, you know, and I'm proud of the work that y'all have done to create that. Cause I know that y'all are still getting those calls. Yeah. You know, you're talking about it yesterday. I mean, the number of people that have come back to treatment as a result of picking up that phone call, even though they hadn't picked up five or six times over five or six months before, they pick up and they're able to tell somebody that they trust or Cumberland Heights, yeah, whom they trust as the entity, hey, I, actually, I'm not doing well. <sighs> the value that really didn't start to shape itself up until a few years ago because I can't tell you how many people will call, let's see, 15, 20 times over the course of a year at different points. And they finally answer on the very last contact attempt before I'm moving them over into a different portion of my chart because, you know, sure. I've done everything I could. Yeah. Right. And they finally answer and they're falling apart. And it's, you know, I hope there's somebody watching who had that experience because it's happened over and over and over again where it's like they're finally ready to talk. And they don't say it then, but a week into treatment or two weeks into treatment, they'll tell me it's like, man, thank you for calling, right? Or when you called, like, and I ignored your call or whatever, they'll sometimes they'll apologize for not answering. It was like, dude, I get why you didn't answer. 
<laughs> I would not have answered in your position either. But to know that every time I did call, they saw the call, it holds just as much value as the call that got answered mm. because they knew I still cared and I was not going to leave them alone for any other reason. But I can't, you know, I wanted to be a part of their process with them, whatever that part of their, whatever that part of their process looked like. And so I, I share this with you know, anytime I do orientations and things like that. The calls where everybody's doing great are wonderful. The ones where, you know, men and women have found the freedom. You can hear it in their voice. You can sense it in their words that that they're finally on a on a different trajectory in their life that offers hope and inspiration. They're getting things back. They're experiencing life on life's terms in a way that's actually constructive. Those are wonderful in their inspiration on their and they give me all the hope in the world. But the ones that I sit on the phone with somebody who's in crisis for an hour and just walk through what 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 happened, what's going on, what should we do next? We work out a plan, or you know, we put together you know some kind of some kind of common solution to to get out of whatever rut they're in, whatever that looks like. Or I inspire them to finally make that decision to go get a sponsor what, through whatever you know means um, are the most incredibly valuable thing because those are conversations that would have never happened otherwise. They weren't going to call me. They weren't going to go to a meeting and ask. Mm. Right? They weren't there. But we we have this opportunity to take them from right up to that decision to beyond it, and it's incredible to be a part of something like that, that, like I said, wouldn't have existed otherwise. I want to shift gears with you a little bit. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask you the question I'm thinking about. For the person thinking about going to treatment right now, listening to this podcast, listening to your voice, what would you tell them to expect? How would you tell them to prepare? Here? Anywhere. So I went to treatment in July of 2008. You can't even <laughs> say 20. You can't say 2008. 2008. And I think my expectations already were to feel like this was going to be punitive, to feel like I was going to hear about what I did wrong and I was going to get negative consequences for the decisions I had made. Right. And so all my, it was like going, it was like, it was like adulting going to the principal's office for a month. And I was going to feel shame and I was going to have to explain myself away and I was going to have to get small and hide. And for whatever reasons those were, what I could have been expecting that would have changed probably my first week was that there were people waiting for me that had been waiting for me for a very long time to show me the love that I was unable to show myself and to invite compassion into my life in a way that I had never had compassion invited into my life and give me solutions to the problems I didn't even know I had yet. Because so much of my addiction was solution. My addiction was not, you know, I wasn't running from anything that I knew of. I was running to more of what I knew I wanted. And so when when getting what I wanted stopped working, that's when treatment became, you know, the most viable option for me because it was like, okay, well, your most prominent solution is no longer valid. What now? And so the idea that someone had a better idea about how to live than me almost kept me from going in. But I think the ego mm. um, dissolving desperation that I experienced was just enough to help me cross that threshold. And here in in and then the first three days of treatment were enough to keep me in treatment because I realized, oh okay, not only are there people here just like me who've experienced what I've experienced, there are people here just like me who've experienced what I've experienced that are living a life beyond their wildest dreams. Yeah. And so there must be something to it. 
It reminds me, uh, I heard this a long time ago, but getting clean is never convenient. <laughs> you know, like, and my experience was I expected it to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, like the right time and the right place and I'm going to feel great about it. And in my experience, like that just wasn't the case. And I was misdirected to have that expectation. Sure. Right. Well, you were young too, weren't you? I was young. I was 20. Yeah. You know, so, it, you know, the leaves need to be a certain color. You know, I need to have the right attitude. You know, my loved ones need to be operating with the right, with the right expectation, whatever it was. And it's just never convenient. And so that for me helped me make that initial um, cause I was inspired to come to treatment from the West Alabama narcotics task force. Yeah. They're, it's a very inspirational. They were very inspirational I mean. and, <laughs> um, it helped me move through that convenience factor of needing it all to kind of line up, which was probably some element of control for me. Yeah. Right. That, that, that I think many people struggle with. I think I, what I'll say on top of that is too, is that in terms of expectations, I don't think anyone should expect any more willingness of themselves than they need to just cross that threshold. 100%. Because I didn't have the willingness to stay clean for the rest of my life when I came to treatment. That I couldn't was not agree more. Part of the, that was not part of the package. Right. I didn't have I didn't have willingness to cl stay clean the entire time I was in treatment when that I went same. to treatment. Yep. And so... Um, That's a great point. The assumption that somehow I have to be across some invisible line... Um, is also is probably the most destructive because I'm not ready can come in a lot of different forms. And I'm not ready really isn't your responsibility. I wasn't ready until I had a, a, an appropriate substitute to my problem. And I damn sure wasn't going to find out about it outside of outside of treatment in the in the world that I had created for myself. Right. Other than in jail. You know, right. when I had to, you know, figure it out we all get spirituality in jail. Well, I can't speak to all. Right. All the people I was in jail with got spirituality in jail. Right. Right. So another big question I'm going to lay on you. You're going to love this one. What's recovery? So it's interesting you said that. Um, I think recovery is an active change in our actions and our ideas. And so... I learned that from the basic text of Narcotics Anonymous because it's in there. Shout One of the out. very few things I quote. And I can't say what page it was on or what paragraph, so I don't have that going for me. But the active change part um, is really important because I think as we learn to shed away old behaviors and old ideas and old words and old constructs of our thinking – what we discover is that we're f even more free than we thought possible. And so recovery looks different at different stages. It's big stuff in the beginning. It's very, it's very cut and dry. It's very don't use no matter what. Go to meetings, call your sponsor, do this, or whatever your program looks like, be committed to it. Mm -hmm. right? And so almost like a triage state of recovery where, you know, you, you, know, you, yeah. you can go to the hospital and, it's, it's a lot different in the emergency room than it is in rehab you know, right. and physical, physical therapy and things. So it's like I think recovery is – let me say this. I remember – I don't know why I want to say it, but I'm going to say it. And it can get cut out if it's unnecessary. Don't but, cut it out. <laughs> don't cut it out and then it flashes to like five minutes later. <laughs> um, so – I looked up the word addict, and it might have been while I was still in treatment, and I don't know which dictionary it was, but the definition of addict was a slave awarded to a debtor in repayment of, a, of whatever it is, whatever the debt is. So the idea that somehow a debt was owed and that I have been enslaved per whatever that whatever that desired outcome was, right? And so I dig the slave part, right? And I think a lot of people can identify with that, even people who aren't in recovery. The debt part is what always got me in the, in the consideration of, hmm. 
the consideration of what do I owe, right? So I know now that whatever reason my life turned out the way it turned out and whatever reason, you know, all the other people that I know who are in this process have had their lives turn out is because we do owe something. I think everyone in the world owes something. But I think for us, we owe something so deep that we have to live a certain way in order to repay it. From the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I am in service to something, right? Whether I'm using or not. And so without using, I get to choose what I serve. And so I serve the most inspiring things and I serve the most rewarding things and I serve the things that bring me to my knees in, you know, tears of joy on a regular basis. And I think recovery, regardless of what shape it takes, is that. It's this, it's this notion that I am eternally in service to whatever it might be. And there's a big difference between abstinence and recovery. I know a lot of people who are abstinence with, abstinent without it. I know a lot of people who are in recovery without abstinence. Mm-hmm. But the, the idea is, for me, that if I wake up every morning with purpose and with a drive to be of maximum service, regardless of what the setting, regardless of who comes in front of me, then everything everything gets better. Yeah. And recovery is, it's not just getting back everything I lost or right. gave away. It's, it's, it's bringing new light into other places of the world that I didn't know existed. Yeah. It, um, I think when I was first introduced to the idea of recovery, cause I had, I had no idea when I started my treatment journey. I mean, that it was in treatment that I was introduced to the idea of recovery. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I think that I associate it with an event, you know, something I caught, <laughs> um, some time period that passes by where I don't have the problem anymore. And what I learned, and I like that you brought up service because I think service can take almost like a gratitude, you know, um, almost like the word God. We come in, I, I came in with a lot of associations with language that maybe over time didn't serve me. Um, like they do today. And service is one of those where service is a posture of our heart. And in my experience, it's a posture of my heart. And being of service, waking up every day and choosing to be of service, whether that's being of service in your home group or being of service in your job or being of service in your family, right? Because recovery doesn't just happen in meetings. You know, uh, we've talked about this before. Recovery was actually designed for, you know, the 365 days, the, the 23 hours outside yeah. of a meeting every day, yeah. um, as quiet as it's kept. <laughs> and I think that when I think about recovery, I think about how genuine, authentic, and vulnerable am I with my fellow people around me, with my community? Um, what actions am I taking to pursue a relationship with my higher power? And what's the posture of my heart in terms of service? Yeah. You know, that to me is the act of change of our ideas and our attitudes that you talked about, you know, because the problems, quote unquote, that I came in with at Cumberland Heights 13 years ago have, have un undoubtedly shifted. But the, the, for me, hate to be that guy, the solution that I operate in does very simply have that groundwork in genuine, vulnerable, and authentic expression with my peers, period. Because I could, I, I've done a lot of, I've made a lot of missteps along the yeah. way, you know. I've acted out. I've said nasty things to people. Who cares, you know? Um, but as long as I have that, that as long as I kept myself accountable to telling Casey or Stacy or Starla or Ryan or whoever's in this room with us, you know, hey, you know what? This is like you were talking about the RCA team. I'm actually not doing well. Yeah. That that to me is like that hinge point of recovery. Um. That is super important, you know, for people to remember. Yeah, the assumption of control is what gets us where we're at. Mm. So, 
I think the less we I think the less we hang on that notion, the better off we are. Yeah. So talk about alumni. You know, talk about what you do with alumni at Cumberland Heights. Um how that's shifted or how that's changing, new challenges that lie ahead. The work that I do with the alumni of Cumberland Heights is like an unquenchable thirst because it's I inherited a responsibility that was once held by a lot of people. And yeah. it's still, I mean, the Alumni Association of Cumberland Heights is still thriving. And if you're an alumni and you're listening to this, then you're more than welcome to come join a meeting anytime on the first Friday of every month in the founder's room before crossover. But uh, what COVID did in kind of diminishing the opportunity that the Alumni Association had to be of service to our patients and diminishing the opportunity to get together and gather and, you know, be involved really, really took a toll. And, uh, and so watching it reemerge and watching it come back alive has been really amazing. And, um, knowing that I'm just a small, you know, part to play in the whole thing, but I get to, the one thing that I do get to do is plan and schedule creative activities and events and workshops and things like that, that I hope make a difference in the lives of the people who attend them. And not only that, like continue to reflect that Cumberland Heights cares about people's ability to live and enjoy life. Yeah. Right. Um, it has been an amazing thing to, you know, continue to create, uh, you know, kind of, you know, without using the wrong terminology, create programming for people who are, you know, five days, five months, five years, five decades sober and, and, uh, and watch them, you know, watch them continue to enjoy what we have to offer. And, uh, and it, it drives me to be more creative. It drives me to be more, um, involved and, uh, intuitive and try to listen. And honestly, my biggest hang up is getting out of the way and just, you know, letting people do what they need to do. I mean, it's a huge honor for somebody who's not an alumni of Cumberland Heights Foundation, yeah, um, to be able to be part of what what goes on because it's a big it's a big deal, man. Um, and the people who the people who value their foundation are people who tend to lay new foundations for more people, and so the people who are who are active. And I don't want to start naming names because sure. I won't yeah. I won't yeah. be able to say them all. all yeah. Yeah. But the people who are active in crossover and aftercare and have been and will be are people who make a meaningful change for people they might never see again. And, um, and it's amazing, you know. And um, Well, I just think about, like, the thousands of people that we can't even remember their names. Like, exactly. um, <laughs> right now we're cleaning out the archive. Oof which for anybody listening is like a series of boxes yeah. up on a shelf that over the years more stuff gets piled in there and pictures. And uh, one of the things that dawned on me last time I took a peek was all the pictures of the coin ceremonies mm. that we have, like hundreds, thousands, you know, and some of them, you know, three-piece suits from the 1970s, oh, yeah. you know, Polaroids. You know, we even have Betamax tapes back there really? that I need to get. Tra I, mean, I didn't even know Betamax tape exists. I didn't even know what that technology was. This is pre VHS. I've yeah. learned. So, anyways, yeah, they thought Beta was going to be the one, but I get yeah VHS yeah. went over. Um, or some kind of. But you're right. Like we're just the proprietors of today. That's it. Yeah, we just preparing for the folks that are going to come after you know, and a part of the larger community for those that have been here in the beginning or in the middle or wherever they were, but. Um, when I see things like the alumni picnic each year and we show up and we see how many people show, come with their kids and yep. their spouses and I don't know half the people there, mm. you know, uh, but strike up a conversation or two and, you know, I used to be a clinician here 25 years ago. Really? You know, there was a parking lot over there and there was a tree hanging to the left. Yeah. Right there. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And um, I, me, personally, I have a lot of pride for the community that, that, Cumberland Heights played a small part in creating sure. over the last, you know, 50 some odd years that 
I would like to think in some ways has done its part in supporting the recovery community in, in middle Tennessee, you know, that's something that I think, um, when we're talking about what is treatment, what to expect, what is recovery? The reason I ask those questions is I think there's sometimes a lot of misinformation about what to expect and what the journey is really about. Sure. You know, that we're really teaching people a new way to live. And I know if you're in recovery, you're like, Nick, stop. Cause that's something we say all the time. Right. But it's, it's the truth. It's, it's what folks should expect. It's not an event. It's a process. It won't happen overnight. It'll take place over time. And the community, whether that's alumni or our staff or what have you, those little interactions that you're talking about in the hallway when somebody's smiling and you are not in a smiling mood, <laughs> you know, those add up yeah. to a significant change in your ideas and your attitudes. Sure. Yeah, it's it's um being here is is incredibly special. Just being like the energy here and yeah. you know, getting to getting to build long term relationships with people who have the same goals and you know want the same things for for our patients is um, being a part of that community is is probably one of the, the highlights of my life so far. Well, you're really good at it. And because of your presence at Cumberland Heights, a lot of things have grown in a really beautiful way, namely the RCA program. And I know you wouldn't say that about yourself, but I'll say it. I you appreciate know? it. And shout out to Randall Lee, too. Yeah, please. You know? I'm I mean, sure. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it's it's just been a – like you were talking about yesterday, the countless lives that have been touched that we weren't even, like, expecting and aware of, right. you know – is super what an honor uh i'm curious from your perspective just with all the different patients because you meet almost every single patient that comes through you know different programs yeah. or a, a, at least a good portion of them and I, i'd be curious we talk about um how treatment is changing we talk about how recovery is changing a lot with other guests and i'd be curious your perspective since you've been here 2016 to 2023 how are the patient's needs changing? Are they changing? How how is our pro how have our programs changed? Do they need to change? I think the emotional and spiritual effects of addiction are pretty standard. I think I think people have, you know, a a baseline interaction with the that lower part of themselves, you know, that that kind of leaves everyone in the same same boat a lot of times. I think it's harder. I think I think because there are more resources for people at varying stage of stages of addiction than there ever have been. What do you mean resources? Um well, um both both medical interventions like Narcan, um, you know, medically assisted treatment programs that people end up on a lot earlier than they would seek an abstinence based program. Um more education, more advocacy, um, more general, you know, I mean, I, I compare it to my own experience and I'm not much older than many people at all, but all, all I really had, I had, I had education about addiction from my family, which was what addiction looked like. And then I had education in school, which looked like dare, which was a, which was a very cut and dry, don't do it. Right. If you're exposed to it, respond, you know, with complete, you know, yeah, refusal yeah. and no, no middle ground. Yeah. And then the only other thing that I saw were was on the news. And so I think now there is a general sense of understanding. I think stigma has been replaced by interest hmm. in addiction and. So because of that, I think more parents and more lo loved ones and spouses and things like that are more understanding of what, what, what happens. Uh, you know, the opioid epidemic has definitely opened up a new chapter in that discussion. And so not to get too sidetracked with that, but to answer your question more appropriately, I think, I think people come here People show up here a lot more educated about 
addiction than they ever have been. Um, and because there's less of a stigma, I think people are more open in general to what long-term treatment can look like because a lot of the excuses that I heard 10 years ago about why I'm not going to sober living is because one, I don't want everybody knowing I can't even live in my own house or I can't even live with my own mom, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. I need that. I need this much help because it was, it was a shameful thing to need help that much. Mm -hmm. Right, which I mean, we're already we we're built to need help, and we just don't know it. But whether we're addicts or not, but I think now the conversation about what it's going to take to stay clean or sober or whatever the case may be starts a lot sooner than it used to. Whereas it used to take three weeks into treatment before you're even somewhat, you know, in the in the ballpark. Uh, about what it was gonna, what kind of commitment was gonna need to be made. I think there's more of an understanding now, and then you know the same thing is too. You know, as as generations turn over and uh, young people become middle aged people and middle aged people become older, uh, you start to see different uh, cultural traits kind of enter into the recovery community, and so it's not always just about what happens here. It's about the first groups of people we meet when we leave here and do we feel like we can attach to those communities? Do we feel comfortable in those communities? Do we feel like we've, uh, that like we can find our own place there? Like I had a really long conversation with someone yesterday about belonging and how, how imperative that is in early recovery to feel like I belong somewhere and what it takes to get there. And we are so isolated because we're on the tail end of, I don't know when the first iPhone came out, I'm pretty sure it was right around seven. Yeah, right around when I got clean. But that that f- that framework has. I mean, this is you know kind of going way off. But I think it has really changed the way we communicate with each other in terms of recovery in a negative light because it takes face to face, knee to knee contact to start to really generate those feelings that I need to feel like I know where I'm at and where I belong and where I'm going and how to get there. So that is. I'm fascinated by both of your answers because there was really like a hopeful attitude that you presented about what's changed, that there's more awareness, that it's easier to have the conversation about the steps that are most associated with long-term success. That outlook, stigma seems to be reduced. That outlook is a whole lot more positive than I would have assumed. The element of social media, and I haven't even had this thought as a recovering person myself, but as the generations of who you meet once you leave treatment, traditionally, in Mm -hmm. terms of 12-step culture, is changing. I just started accessing my own memories about the good old club, you know, no, no, no offense. This is not the official opinion of Carmel and Heights or any of the institution I'm associated with, (laughs) but like pleated khakis, cigarette smoking, billowing. Styrofoam cups, baby. Styrofoam cup. Let's go. Double, triple black coffee. (laughs) You know, like maybe. How um, how many grounds can you fit in a bun? A lot. I'm here to tell you all the way to the top. There's still dry coffee in that thing after the pot's (laughs) made. Dang. (laughs) But there was – I don't know if I've taken time to unpack whether or not that's changed. And I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just saying, like, it, it's interesting because we are getting older. And I would like to think that – let me back up. MAT is a good example. Okay. I got clean right around the time that MAT was a hot topic, certainly hotter than it is today in terms of its role in recovery, yeah. its role in our treatment centers – What I've learned from people that have been around longer than us is the same conversation happened when SSRIs first came on the scene in the 90s, I think. And there was a lot of rigidity, flexibility to, hey, you're welcome. It only takes a desire. A lot of that has shifted. And I'm proud of that because it's not my job to tell anybody else how to recover. It's just my job to show up, be of service, share some experience, strength, and hope, period. Right. And I hope that 
sometimes it's funny, like in treatment, like we expect all of patients to be like really well behaved, like not cause any issues. And I'm like, wait, why do we have that expectation? You know, like, like, and in meetings, like we expect everybody to understand the tradition of how meetings run, the nomenclature of the language, you know, yep. and I've seen people get like real bent out of shape oh, yeah. with somebody with two days clean. And I'm like, Hey man, maybe we could just like have a loving conversation <laughs> And guide somebody in the right direction and not shame them in a group of strangers where they're probably already feeling super uncomfortable in their own skin. Yeah. So all of the anxiety. Yeah, all of the anxiety. So it's interesting that you mentioned the social media thing and how that is entered into the chat, if you will. Yeah. Because I'm with you. I think it is absolutely negatively affected how we develop relationships just i'm not even talking about treatment or recovery i'm just talking about culturally yeah it's how created barriers for sure yeah across the across the paradigm i mean you know whether you're somebody who struggles with substance use disorder or not i think people are finding it very difficult to attach themselves to others in a meaningful way just in general we're a disconnected society and so connection becomes that much more important and elusive because you know, we're not teaching each other the same way we used to. I mean, I've got memories, man, from when I was a kid of like being so incredibly dependent on whether or not so and so was going to come out of their house today or not. Right. Right. And if he doesn't come, I don't know what I'm going <clears> to <throat> do today if he doesn't come over. Right. <laughs> and that kind of stuff just, I don't think that exists anymore. I don't, mm. I don't. Kids don't go out and play like they used to. Hmm. And whether that's got anything to do with it or not, I don't know. Talk about what you mean by knee to knee. I think it'd be interesting for you to unpack that. So The value of, quote, knee to knee. Sure, yeah. Well, we're sitting directly across from each other for a reason, and I think I think there's a, a biological component to that, and I think there's definitely a, a way to – so I look at it and, you know – two different dimensions. There's shoulder to shoulder and there's knee to knee. And so we're facing the same direction, but we're looking at each other, right? And we're looking to each other. And what that says, I think, to the body and to the heart is I am looking for something in you and I'm looking for you to respond in a certain way. I do a group, I haven't done it here in a while, but where, where you have to sit and talk for two minutes and the other person can't respond can't respond by with any kind of like physical feedback, verbal feedback, nothing. You just got to sit there and listen, right? And the other person can tell you whatever they want. They can tell you a funny story. They can tell you a sad story, whatever the case may be. But you have to do everything you can not to respond. And the feelings that come up on both sides of that are so intense because for the speaker, they need feedback. They need to know that everything is okay, right? They need to know that what, what they just said didn't hurt your feelings or – that what they're about to say is going to be interpreted, you know, openly or what, you know, whatever the case may be. And so much of our cues are based on that. And for the listener, they want so badly to respond verbally, physically, in all those ways, especially if it's emotional, they want to be able to meet that need. Right. And that's just a conversation. That's not a therapeutic alliance. And you take that to the next level. Um, there is something so incredibly entrenched in us when we when we sit down and we do that work in a private space or outdoors and it doesn't matter where I think I think there is we, we access parts of ourselves and we access parts of each other that wouldn't exist otherwise shoulder to shoulder and you didn't ask me that question but shoulder to shoulder facing the same direction accesses a, in my opinion a completely different part of us I can say things when I'm walking on a trail, hiking next to my wife, to her that I would never say if she was looking at me in my face. <laughs> never. It just wouldn't think of it. Wouldn't come up. Not that I'm scared to say or anxious that she'd give me some kind of negative feedback. Just things that I don't think about. Because being with someone mm -hmm. can take on a lot of different shapes. And so... I think the emotional intelligence that has come to me in my recovery, I didn't learn it, I don't think, in college or from mm -hmm. anybody who was teaching me how to be a therapist or any of that. I think that kind of stuff comes so naturally to us because we learn, okay, this person is not ready for that conversation, but they might be ready for this one. 
And I remember my first shoulder to shoulder walk. I remember the first time I broke down crying because I, I felt okay to, I couldn't sit here and cry in front of you, but I can stand and cry next to you. And it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing, man. And I don't know if that's what you were asking me about. But. Absolutely. I love it. I love the topic because it's about the process and not the content. Yeah. I think um, one of the things people I think that struggle with addiction are just big thinkers, very cerebral, generally speaking, in my opinion. Yeah. And so I've had a lot of time to think. And one of the things I've thought a lot about is the process, the unspoken process that takes place shoulder to shoulder, knee to knee in a meeting setting. Mm. Like we sit in a circle for a reason, yeah. you know, like, and, or a, or a oblong or a square. Generally speaking, we're facing each other. Generally. There are other modalities of spiritual access where all the chairs are facing one direction right. and it's up and away. Yep. Hey, and I participate in that and celebrate that. And it has a very special role in my life. Sure. Just want to say that caveat, but in recovery, one of the things that I love about those environments is all of that's intentional. Yeah. Because like we're talking about in terms of being genuine, authentic and vulnerable, in terms of learning how to communicate knee to knee or stand shoulder to shoulder, in terms of the negative impacts that social media has had on creating disconnection, not coming out and skateboarding, if you will, <laughs> you know, and like really relying on that, is that recovery takes place in the whites of other people's eyes. Mm. You know, and that recovery, especially if you're participating in a home group, is all about really generating the close relationships with those people. It's not even, I mean, in my opinion, it's not even about checking off the box of number of meetings and the education you're going to receive. Sure. No. It's that I know what's happening in Casey's life and he knows what's happening in mine. Yeah. And you string some of that together over a number of years and real change can take place. And I'll start really relying on some of those relationships to say, hey, Things aren't well or things are going great. And when my when my butt's falling off, they know how to get in touch with me. Yeah. And how to hold me accountable. And so there's all that meta change that's happening in a meeting space that is absolutely intentional. That's unique, I think, to a recovery domain. Yeah, the space between prayers. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. It's something else, man. That was some of the first magic I think that attracted me to the program because I I got clean in Alabama too, and uh, shout out Wiregrass Club in Dothan, Alabama. Shout I got out. my paper signed there a bunch of times, way before I was ever ready to do anything about what was going on in the meeting. And uh, <laughs> that group of people was just so solid. And it just felt like, you know, I mean, I was glad they had something to do, you know? I was glad that they had found right. a solution to their problem. I did not want recovery. I was high th while I was in the meeting. Right. And, but it was something very attractive about how much respect and how much space they gave, like gave each other and how they greeted one another. Right. Like I had never been around. How known they were to yeah, each other. Exactly. Yeah. And like they already knew stuff about what was going on with outside of the meeting. It's like, what's it? You know, I had been to. <laughs> It just was so foreign, and I know that's not true for everyone, but it was it was so foreign to my experience that when the shift did occur for me, I knew that it would be okay. As long as I could find my tribe, I knew I would be okay. I just needed to feel like, because the shift was, did I belong there or not? Did I Could I access what they had accessed? Because I was so terminally unique right that they had a thing that I didn't that I couldn't have I just it didn't apply to me and so that that turnabout was probably the the key right it was the key to the change that actually took place this is why I'm so excited about you know the ability to just do our part not anything we're not moving mountains but each person that chooses Cumberland Heights or chooses any space to heal matters. Yeah. And speaking for a second on behalf of Cumberland Heights Foundation, every person that chooses Cumberland Heights and their family matters a great deal to us. Yeah. And our ability to stay in contact with them through 
a good old picnic with great food or consistent RCA phone calls really matters. And the space, I think, for you to help them feel one relationship at a time that they too can access. Yeah. And they too don't always have to be the protagonist in their own story, if you will. Sure. Terminally unique, fatally cool, as we like to say. And that they're welcome to is absolutely what everything that we do is about. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a connection point that I think, you know, I think we look at the space as like 12-step recovery here and yeah. treatment here. And there's definitely a blending effect that happens naturally with Cumberland Heights. But I think more than more than that, it's a lot of times Cumberland Heights is the first place that our patients get to come back to and serve. Mm, yeah. Right. And, you know, you call it volunteerism if you want. But really what it is, is it's it's a it's a, it's an action of the heart that takes place. Like I want to come back to crossover. And then they're like, oh, they get here. And they're like, oh, crossover, you know, and they're back on campus and it feels good. And they have, you know, joyous memories or terrible memories. And they go find their, where they sign the, you know, butt hut or whatever. And, yeah. and, and then they go to the meeting. And when the meeting starts and they realize, oh, these, these aren't the patients that I went, that I was here with. These are all, this all new faces. Right. And then they realize, oh, cause I remember that moment. It's like, oh, I'm here for a reason. <laughs> Right. I'm not here just to go to a meeting. Right. I'm here to because I have something to offer. Right. Right. Even if it's only a little bit. Yeah. And that shift, man, that's the next level. That's the whole, that's the whole, <laughs> you know, that's the, that ain't, that ain't the juice. That's the, that's the smoothie, baby. Let's. <laughs> the smoothie of recovery. You've heard it here first. Yeah. Well, I love you, man. Thanks for being here. We're really grateful you took some of your time to be here. Yeah. We'll have we gotta have you on again. Sure. Have some other people too. I mean, you know. Absolutely. All the people. All the people. Thanks, guys. Thank you.